Happy Earth Day. Today, we are going to look at this gorgeous har har kabocha squash. And we're going to make this amazing soup that I got from Allison Roman, but I'm going to simplify it for us because sometimes we just don't want to labor around our stovetop. And so I'm just going to do a real quick version. This is excellent for refeeding if you are in a fasting state right now and you are here because you want to do an FMD or you have done one or maybe you've done many prolon episodes and you want to get off of that and try a DIY version. Highly recommend it. And um, yep, let's get to it. So this is called squash lentil soup. I need my lentils. One moment. All right. We've got our lentils, but the star of the show is really this kobacha squash. And part of eating well is eating a variety of different foods. And so when is the last time you've had A, squash, <laughs> or B, a different kind of squash? Maybe you always stick to a butternut or something like that, or like zucchini, that kind of a squash. This I have used to kind of steer clear from because I don't want to handle it. I have almost maimed myself in terms of like trying to cut through it. So here is a raw kabocha with my chef's knife. And it's, it's not like super hard and you can just take it on your board and just roll the squash instead of trying to maim this guy. But what I have done is simply nuked it. So let's get right into it. This is our adorable little squash. And I've nuked it for about 10 minutes. And so I'm just gonna show you, I pierced it just to test it a little bit and look how easily we're cutting through this. And my chef's knife, I'm telling you, it, it needs to be sharpened. Alternatively, you can just, ooh, she had, just roll the kabocha, 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 kabocha. And it's just peeling off like so easily. Oh, 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 nice. Okay, so we could just do that. And then what we want to do is remove the seeds. And the cool thing about kabocha is that the skin is actually edible. Isn't that neat? I think that I'm going to make a, a yellow kabocha soup today. So I'm not going to eat or include the skin in my version. I need my little trash bowl. Our little trash bowl, discard the seeds. Or maybe we should, I don't know. What do you think? I've scrubbed it down. It's nice and clean. Why don't we go ahead and do that? So even though I've nuked this, for 10 minutes. It's not fully cooked through. Ooh, she had it. So we need about, Ellison Roman says like a small kabocha or about two pounds of this baby. So I'm gonna do this entire kabocha or maybe just half. I don't know. This is how I cook. I just kind of do what, <laughs> what I feel like doing. And this is the fun way to cook because I don't love following recipes. <clears throat> it is flu season here in our household. So we have all been hit with some kind of seasonal flu. Probably. Oh, what am I doing? Ah, this is my trash bowl, not my soup bowl. See, you can be a confused mess in the kitchen and still make delicious food. <laughs> All right, so we're just popping it on here. And what I love about this recipe is it is truly a one part, one pot wonder. You know what I might just do is I might save this half and just kind of make like muffins. So let's just do a half for now put her away. And then we're going to add our aromatics. So I like to do lots of garlic. I mean, 
I'm Korean, so I'm going to always include a lot of garlic. So let's just do a lot of garlic. I've got, what is that, five cloves. So I'm just going to slice it kind of thinly, but not get too crazy about how thin this is going to be because ultimately I'm going to immersion blend this soup and it's going to be luscious and the texture is going to be beautiful. All right, so we've got our garlic in here and then we're going to put an entire onion in here. And again, like don't worry about those chopping skills. It just doesn't really matter. Okay. So I'm gonna take off this top layer. This onion doesn't look like the freshest onion in the world. Like that layer looks kind of yucky, so I'll just remove all of that. See how it kind of, yeah, kind of nasty looking. Well, that's unfortunate. We can always get another onion. And I'm just going to roughly chop. If you feel too lazy getting another onion, then don't. Just use, <laughs> use what you got. Use what you got, girl. All right, now, got this so far. We're going to add in just a teeny, teeny bit of this red chili flakes because when you add in just a little bit and you're cooking this baby down, it is so good. It adds so much yummy flavor. So I'm not going to add in too much because as this stuff heats up and cooks down, it's going to intensify in the spiciness. All right. Now we've got one and a half cups of lentils. So I'm going to do these guys. Let's make sure that because these lentils are so little, we need like a fine mesh strainer. Oh, I'm sneezed. Ooh. Let's do this guy. And I'm going to do about a cup and a half. I'm just going to kind of guess. I think that looks pretty good. Rinse that up, add that to the pot. These are so cute. Could probably use a little bit more, but let's just leave it at that. All righty, and eight cups of water. This is literally eight cups of water. So let's add this all in. And we've got a big pot of yumminess. So here we go. All we're going to do is put this on the stovetop. But here's a couple of things. So Alison Roman will um, obviously saute her onion like a true chef and use butter, use oil. You can do that if you would like. Um, we don't have any butter in this house. We don't consume butter unless it's in the food when we go out. That's how I kind of like save on that kind of that type of saturated fat, which I don't want too much of. And I could absolutely saute these onions and do that thing for like five to 10 minutes over the stovetop. But this is a great hack because it's easy. Um, for you know, no oil people, there's no oil in this version, except I'm gonna add in this. So this, these are non-chicken bouillon cubes. Allison Roman's original recipe calls for either just water or broth or bouillon. So definitely add the bouillon. And then I don't add any additional salt to this because this is salty. There's a tiny bit of oil in these, but I mean, it's to me, it's negligible. So let's just crumble that in. And then we are going to get this onto the stovetop and it's gonna cook down. And really, I just wanna cook down these lentils. Okay, so let's do that. And then I'm gonna tell you about how my refeeding has been going and I'm going to answer some questions about the fasting mimicking diet. All right, so here we go. Get this on here.
get our immersion blender ready. So after our soup cooks down and the flavors are nice, um, I'm gonna immersion blend this and just zip, zip, zip this just a little bit. And uh, trying to like squash and <laughs> needed to watch this live. L, I totally hear you for years. I try to become a squash girl and it's so hard. So my little hack was instead of like pumpkin pie, I made a kabocha squash pie. And let me tell you, it was delicious, but one cannot like eat pie all the time, right? So this soup is sweet. Kabocha squash is a little bit sweeter than like a butternut. If you don't even want to handle the kabocha part and getting this big gourd and dealing with it, I'm going to tell you, this is what you do. My husband, he stole our butternut squash, but you just get the frozen ones, okay? It's already pre-chopped, it's frozen, it's fresh, it's picked at the peak of freshness, and you just open this up and you add it into your soup. So I see he has left me about an eighth of a cup. <laughs> Let's just include it in our soup. All right, so we are gonna let that come to a boil and then we are going to immersion blend it. We're going to mix it. We're going to season it. If it needs it, it probably won't because I'm just gonna let it be. And then that way, if you share the soup, because this is gonna make quite a lot of soup, it's gonna make like six to seven cups of soup. Um, and that way people can just enjoy it and then salt it to their liking or spice it up to their liking. And that's it. And this soup, even though I'm not really a total squash person, I love this soup. And I've been making it for like the last, I don't know, at least two months. Um, actually, since January. <laughs> it's been since January. And I've made it for other people who don't traditionally like eating like healthy food. <laughs> and they have loved it. So you know that that's always a good testament, right? All right. So that's about it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to top this soup with herbs. So I have some fresh cilantro. This has been washed. I'll just chop it up, top my soup with that. Allison Roman in true chef style, she likes to drizzle a little bit of olive oil over the soup, more salt, lots of freshly cracked pepper. I'm going to do freshly cracked pepper. I'm going to do more of these chili flakes. I'm going to do some fresh herbs and... I have a fennel and sometimes these leaves on the fennel, when you pick them and you add just a little bit onto, not the stems, don't do the stems, but when you pick these and you just add that to the topping of your soup, you look like you're all of a sudden a gourmet chef. So do that, impress yourself, impress your fam and your friends and it's all good. All right. Well, so that's going to cook down for like 20, 25, 30 minutes. If you're in a huge rush and your squash is already cooked down, then you're really just looking for the lentils to cook. With that much water and on fire, because we have a gas stove, that could technically cook down in 15 minutes. So this could also be very, very fast. What I love about this, and I know a lot of people love the One Pot Wonders, is it's a one pot wonder and it's super easy, but the final product is delicious. Typically when I serve this, it is with a side of crusty bread. So we love our fresh uh, French bread. And then just that with the soup, so good, so good. So I know that, um, so I'm getting a lot of questions about the fasting mimicking diet. So. As we wait for this guy, I'm going to answer some of these questions. But first, it's Earth Day today. Happy Earth Day. Today, on um, behalf of the Earth <laughs> and in celebration of our name being Plant 52, which well, I will tell you the meaning of, um, we're going to plant 52 trees today. Yeah, we're going to donate 52 trees to be planted with the Arbor um, they're called Arbor Day Foundation. Now, Arbor Day Foundation, I discovered them because when one of our puppies had to be put down, she was 16 years old. 
um, the organization that we work through sent me a like just a follow up kind of like, you know, our sympathies kind of card. And within the card, they had made a donation on behalf of our dog. And I just thought that was absolutely amazing. It was the most incredible gift, like one of the most incredible gifts I've ever had. That might seem kind of sad to you. Like what kind of gifts is this be getting in our life? I have gotten many beautiful gifts, but this one just touched me and just such a different way. So I looked them up. They seem pretty cool. I don't really know of any other tree planting organizations. They do quite a bit. They've been around for a long time. I try to look into their board of directors and see if they're, you know, crooks, but <laughs> I don't know. They seem fine. So 52 trees will be donated and planted on behalf of Plant 52 today on Earth Day and see things that say like, you know, we treat our earth as if we have another one to go to. Maybe you're like Elon and like you're planning on going to Mars. Um, I don't have any need to go to Mars. I love our earth and uh, there's so much more to explore on this earth. So I plan on staying here and I want to do my part in taking care of it. We have a young daughter. She's going to grow older and I don't want there to be all these catastrophes that are predicted and are happening right now, actually, um, apparently because of climate chaos. But, you know, they say that when you plant trees, that's what some of these environmentalists say. They say we should eat less meat for sure, because we do a lot of like clearing of the land to make room for all of this grass fed cattle. Um, that's probably better for us. Is it better for the planet? Probably not, <laughs> most definitely not. But in exchange for that, they say not only should we do uh, eat less meat, but we should plant trees. And I was frankly really surprised to hear that because I thought, well, what is planting a couple of trees going to do? But obviously it's giving off all this oxygen and it's just such a symbiotic relationship with us. It's going to clear up all the things that we need to clear up. It's, it's going to do a lot. So these experts are saying that I'm down and that's what we're going to do. So Plant 52 um, is all about creating different habits and doing it slowly, gently, lovingly over time, extending grace to ourselves. Many people want to eat better. They are feeling chronic pain. They don't want to feel this chronic pain anymore. They've tried everything. And if you have tried everything, then I would be very curious to see your list. Like, share it with me. Post it in the comments, send me an email, share it with me, and I'm happy to give you any kind of feedback that may help. You have nothing to lose except a few minutes of sending, typing in a note. But share your list of everything you have tried, and I would love to help. Um, when it comes to changing habits, some of the experts kind of make it sound like it's really easy. It's super simple. Just stop all of your existing habits and just eat more plants, eat your vegetables. In reality, we know that that's very, very difficult. So I don't want to ever minimize how difficult it can be, but I do want to state that in my experience and in coaching some people doing this along the way and in reading hundreds of stories and just in my experience so far, when we do things a little tiny bit at a time consistently and make it a fun ritual, then our chances of success just skyrocket. And so this has been my experience with kicking bad habits as well as developing new ones. And so I always give myself a year. Anytime I'm approaching something that I don't want to give up, it's so hard. It's so sad. I almost like mourn the loss of that bad habit of mine. And I have to mentally and emotionally prepare for, for that change. And so I start thinking about it and almost like meditating on it for like a month prior. And then I will give myself a year's time. So 2024, just or starting today, starting on Earth Day, Monday, April the 22nd, 2024, whatever that is, just give yourself 52 weeks. We're just taking it one week at a time. And if you falter, then you just get back on track, you know, the, just the next time, the next time you eat or the next time you wake up or whatever, whatever, but just being very, very gentle. 
the result of committing to something for one year, again, being very gracious to yourself, is after that year, what do you think is going to happen? Just imagine if you practice one tiny little thing, even if it was for one minute every single day for a year. 365 times of doing that, it's going to be easier. You're going to feel like a pro, whether you know it or not, whether you consider yourself a healthy person or not, you will become a healthy person because you have so much practice doing this. And that is a key of habit change and habit formation is we just have to practice. This is all really basic stuff that you already know, <laughs> but it does bear speaking out loud and just verifying the fact that yes, when we get into the kitchen, when we make beautiful food, just like this every once in a while, but we practice at least once a week, then it becomes so much easier. Okay. And so one of my tools is I call this my cooking therapy. I get all my stuff on this countertop. Everything's clean. Everything's organized. I crank the tunes. I grab a drink. This is just coffee, but you know, whatever. And I just start chopping and I see it as a beautiful break. Many, many people say, I don't have time to cook, but do you have time to take breaks? Like maybe your break is like you pick up your phone, you go on social media. I just do not do that really anymore. Maybe you sit down, you watch a couple of Netflix shows. I can't do that because then I'll get sucked in and then six hours could go by. <laughs> so I just like, don't even go there. I, so I really look at cooking as my break. And so it takes me what, half an hour, pull all this stuff out, chop it up, clean it, put it on the stovetop. I got to mix this thing. It's boiling. She boiling. Oh yeah. So we're going to bring it down to a bit of a simmer. Okay. Now she's simmering and I just get stuff out there. And then as that stuff is cooking, I'm cleaning up, I'm putting everything away. And that way we have an organized space and that is cooking therapy. It's very therapeutic. I get a nice break. And instead of approaching this with the mindset of like, oh, I have to do more work. I really see it as I get to get up from my desk and stand and move my body. Sometimes I just do some yoga stretching, you know, like who says you can't just do squats while <laughs> you know, you're waiting for your soup to cook. Um, so things like that. So it really is a break. It is cooking therapy. And then the end result is I get a delicious bowl of soup with these vivacious herbs and a hit of spice. And I'm putting all this, all these nutrients into me they're having chemical reactions with every single cell in my entire body. There's some resistant starch in that baby. So resistant starch is really good for feeding our good gut bugs, especially in our colon. And that is going to strengthen our immune system. It's going to strengthen the nutrient quality of our blood flow. It's just going to do so many things. So T. Colin Campbell is a biochemist. He is a phenomenal man. He just turned 80 years old this past weekend on Saturday, and he's on no meds. <laughs> he's 100% plant-based, but I love that he is not crazy about it. So he's just like, do your best. If you happen to eat some animal or whatever, just whatever. Just don't be a crazy person. Don't like, you know, go nuts about it, but just have it if you want, um, but just get on with your day. And I love that he and his wife are not on any meds. 90 years old. Wow. I mean, he might look even older than that sometimes, but he is sharp. He is in the process of publishing another book. He's a beautiful writer, but he says that there are hundreds of thousands of phytochemicals in every single whole plant that we eat. And his definition of nutrition is very interesting. He says that within that space, within the expert space, there are many different definitions of nutrition. For him, his definition of nutrition is, and his high recommendation is, for us to eat a variety of whole plant foods. Whole plant foods. That word whole is so, so key. So if I were to have taken that kabocha and juiced it, removing most of the fiber, he's not going to be super happy with that. 
if I were to take that, make it into French fries and deep fry it, not optimal because it's deep fried. And for some reason, that deep frying action strips so many nutrients from the food. So we don't want that. Ideally, it will be the whole thing. So we got whole onion, a little bit. We've got whole garlic. We've got some whole chili flakes. Yeah, that counts. We've got some whole butternut squash. We've got whole kabocha squash. We've got uh, orange or red lentils. And my processed product is my chicken bouillon cube, right? So these guys, this is delicious, by the way. So we've got at least six whole plants. And um, that six times 100,000, <laughs> potentially, we've got 600 thousand different kind of phytonutrients and phytochemicals coursing through our body when we consume this. And what do you think is going to happen? Right? Like it's, we don't really know. And he says nobody will ever have an exact understanding of all of the things that are happening. But what he does say is that it's like a symphony, like everything that is happening in our bodies when we're consuming this food and having these chemical reactions is A, your body is going to have the um, most priority chemical reactions that it should have. So everybody is different. So sometimes online you hear like, everybody's different. I have a different blood type and blah, 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 blah. Well, essentially we're all human beings and we all have the same GI system. We have the same innate system. So we have the same, like, like you have an immune system and a muscular system and cardiovascular system and, and, uh, you know, all these things, a digestive system. And I do too. And why? Because we're humans. So in that sense, we are very, very alike. We have the same type of teeth. <laughs> so these teeth, can I go out and like, not only can I not catch up with like a lion and pierce his flesh with these chompers, um, but these chompers are made for plants. I mean, yeah, it just makes so much sense. Anyway, so when we get into the whole, like, everybody's different, therefore everybody has a different diet kind of stuff, I say there's a tiny bit of truth to that because we are a little bit different. But for the most part, come on, when we eat a bunch of whole plants, all the scientific studies show that that creates really good health. And there is not one good reputable study that shows the health benefits long term on a ketogenic diet. So that kind of blows my mind. It's just interesting. But of course, all the popular people online are the popular people online. <laughs> the ones who say, like, eat your greasy bacon, eat your eggs, eat as much cheese as you want. It's really good for you. You're going to lose weight. You are going to lose weight. But in the interim, in the meantime, there's a lot of fat in that. You're storing that fat in your body. One day you are going to eat carbs again. You are going to eat rice or bread or some sort of starch. And then your body is going to replenish those glucose stores. And then what's going to happen? Yeah, the weight is going to come back on. Long-term ketogenic diet, so many issues, so many issues. It will increase our chances of all-cause mortality. So all possible ways that we could just, you know, um, a little too early in life, that's increasing our chances of that. So no bueno. Did my stove turn off? No. I just couldn't hear it anymore. Okay, Al says, is it the oil that destroys the nutrients or the super high heat? Is it okay to use oil like in an oil fryer or to roast veggies? Right, great question, Al. So I don't know what exactly destroys the nutrients, but I totally assume that it is the super high heat. Absolutely, because some food, I forget what the term is, but some food, when you cook it, it will lose its nutrients. And then other food, you will never lose those nutrients. So like mushrooms, for example, mushrooms apparently have some kind of component that directly gets into the mitochondria. And not every plant does that. But do we have to eat the mushrooms raw because we don't want to like, you know, uh, fend or mess up those nutrients? No, actually, we should always eat our mushrooms cooked, apparently. But even if we cook it down, it's not going to change the nutrient content. So we're still going to be able to access that mitochondria. Um, but then, of course, other foods, you put it under high heat and it's going to strip the nutrients out. So deep frying is kind of a double whammy. You're removing the nutrients 
And not all of them, but I would say most of them, definitely more than half. And then you're also adding in a ton of oil. I started thinking about like French fries in fast food restaurants. And it's not just like normal potatoes that are shaped in their beautiful fries and then deep fried. They're coated <laughs> with tons of chemicals, with preservatives, with whatever makes them taste completely different from when you make them, even deep frying them at home. So lots of additional things that are on those French fries. Is it okay to use oil in your like air fryer or when you're roasting veggies? I think so. So, I mean, it was a hot topic in this plant-based space. So the hardcore, low fat, no oil or very minimal oil camp will say, just don't do that. You can just roast it with just no oil and it'll be fine. As someone who has experienced this and experimented with that, no oil roasting vegetables sad. It just looks sad to me. I like the crisp. I like that additional flavor. Am I adding more calories in there? Absolutely. I don't care though. For me personally, I don't care. And this is where our personal differences will come into play. Um, other people, and these people have cited over 25 studies, have said that there is no adverse effect when we are consuming oil. Do I believe them? Not really, because oil is a processed product, but it's really dependent on like, how do you eat in general? If you tell me like, I eat so many different plants and they're whole, and sometimes I even eat them raw, then I'm going to say you probably do very well. If you tell me I almost never eat processed foods or I might eat like a donut once a month <laughs> or hit the fast food drive through once a month and that's it and I don't drink heavily, and I don't smoke, and sometimes I move my body, and my complete metabolic blood panel looks very good, then sure, fine, of course, add a bit of oil. I mean, what we consume is not going to be perfect. So when I do cook with oil, um, where's my little spray thing? So I will just do a little bit of, you know, just a little bit of this, and it kind of helps control it. When I saute things in a pan, I used to use no oil. So I used to do like one tablespoon of water at a time. And again, for me, because um, I don't have any issues, then I think that I could afford that. Just like I'll eat a donut every once in a blue moon. <laughs> you know, It's just, it's, it's realistic. That's the way I live realistically. Let me give this a little whirl. Oh yeah. So the soup looks exactly the same. It's just the broth is becoming very orange from the color, which is very nice. So I would say um, if you are healthy, if you're not battling some sort of like major chronic illness, if you don't have like chronic inflammation, then maybe a little bit of oil is, is perfectly fine for you. Now, these studies that I mentioned, um, these other experts online, like Gil Carvalho, he has an excellent um, YouTube channel. It's called Nutrition Made Simple by Dr. Gil Carvalho, and he's also a research researcher. He cites over 25 studies, and I haven't read all of these 25 studies, but what's interesting is in these studies, and I'm very curious as to why he doesn't clarify this in these studies they're comparing one thing with another because we always have to compare like compare to what when we're always asking like is it healthy to consume food with oil that some people will say that's an incomplete statement compared to what we're just asking is it healthy or not just tell us <laughs> but all these studies are like compared to using butter versus oil the oil group did better. They had stronger cardiovascular health. They had stronger heart health. They lived longer. They suffered less. But it was always compared to the butter. Well, where is the study that is comparing just oil usage versus no oil usage? I think with everything that we know about eating a bunch of whole plants and eating as few processed products as possible, when we eat whole, 
And we do that consistently and we do a lot of that and we eat very little processed foods because let's be real, we got to live in the real world, then we do very well. So it only makes sense that not having oil, if you have to, if you're super strict versus eating oil, I think the no oil will definitely be healthier for sure. Sometimes an excess of oil, uh, some studies will show will grow, grow tumors. They will grow and allow cancerous tumors to proliferate, which is never what we want. So it really depends on who's asking and what your health situation is, I think. Out of those over 25 studies, though, that Gil mentioned, there was one that showed adverse effects of using oil on cardiovascular health. But I think that's why a lot of these health experts today, um, people who kind of dive into the plant-based space or the health space, and they know of the Campbells, the McDougals, the Esselstyns, the Simon Hills, the Gil Carvalho's, and all of these people, and you know Michael Greger, many of them will be confused now because we've been learning for a decade now at least, no oil, no oil, or very minimal oil. And now the Simon Hills, like it's almost like the younger generation, they're coming out and they're saying like, oil is fine. So if you want to eat a little bit of oil, that's okay. The difference though is I think all of these older folks, like the McDougals, Esselstyns, Dean Ornish, like all of them, they're real doctors who treat real patients. And the patients that come to them are very, very sick. And so as a medical doctor treating a very sick person, are you going to take any risks with your recommendation? Of course not. So you're going to recommend no oil. You want to help them be better. This is why they've come to you. This is why they're hiring you. So if someone were to come to me and say, yeah, I have any kind of cancer or any kind of chronic inflammation, I'm going to say no oil. Sorry. I believe the doctors. Okay. So I am going to get our plate of food. Um, but before that, I did want to answer some questions about the FMD. There are so many questions about the FMD. One that continues to come up is, let's say I'm on day two, I'm on day three, I'm feeling really good on the FMD. Can I extend it? Now, I know you want to extend it because you'll want to hold on to that amazing feeling. But here's what Longo and his scientist friends have said. They have said no. <laughs> So short answer, no, don't extend it. Start coming out of your fast. I promise you, if you refeed well, this recipe is a perfect example of what you can eat while you refeed. Um, if you refeed well, you may feel a little bit like you're in a fasting state still. So when I go into a fasting state, I really see that as getting closer to my natural state. My natural state is abundance. It's actually quite totally chill, uh, very even keel keeled, um, quite happy. And the word optimistic always seems to come up. So I think that that's how we are actually wired. And just a lot of stuff comes into play that just tampers that. Of course, we'll have different chaotic experiences in our lives that we have to go through, unfortunately, and that's going to take effect. But ultimately, when you're in a fasting state, you just feel so good. You feel so good. Now that mental state, you can maintain it when you refeed well. Physiologically, I feel very different because in a fasting state, I am hungry. <laughs> My body knows it and it is suffering. But when I get out of the fast, I feel very, very good because I'm replenishing my glucose stores and that always feels really good. But from mental state, yeah, just, just keep that on. So we have just wrapped up our 30 days post spring group fast. And I am happy to report that my refeeding, just eating a bunch of home plants, not always perfect. And I had French fries twice, <laughs> even though we were trying to do our best. Well, that was my best. So A, I'm being gentle, B, I'm being very gracious and understanding with myself, and C, I have kept the pounds off. So during the fast, I dropped seven pounds, and then um, this morning, I'm still six pounds down from my starting weight. 
I feel much more like myself in terms of just being able to fit into my clothes the way I should. And what I've learned is that, so prior to this fast, I thought I'm just not really going to pay particular attention to what I eat. And I'm just going to eat whatever I want to eat whenever I feel like eating it. And the only thing I'm going to be mindful of is I'm going to try not to stuff myself too much right before bed. So I am trying to stick to the don't eat three to four hours prior to bed. And even with that meal, try to make it like light ish. So you're not like stuffed. We want our bodies to be healing while we're resting and not working to digest food. So when I did that, I gained a lot of weight. <laughs> I gained a lot of weight. I just started expanding like this way and my clothes were really tight. And when I kind of like see images of myself, I see myself spilling over and you always see it in my face and it just, um, you know, I, I still like the way I look, but it looks different and just feeling that tightness in the clothes is not always a great feeling. So it feels really nice to just not feel that way. I think that in my stage of life, you know, perimenopausal, going into menopause, I cannot wait to get into menopause, but in this perimenopausal state where many women are like, I just pack on the pounds. Anything I eat, my body just like, keeps hold of it. And the trick is to learn about food, which I know is a statement that can be unpacked all day long, but we need to understand calorie density. Whole plants, most of them, vegetables, lentils, the kabocha, um, very, very low in calories. So we kind of have to eat a lot more in order to feel full. So let's say you eat 1,500, 2,000 calories a day, you're going to be eating a lot more food than, because 2,000 calories with meat or dairy included, you're going to get to that 2,000 mark pretty quickly. Um, or like bread, bagels, things like that, crackers, popcorn, definitely oil, you'll shoot up there real fast. But when you're just doing this kind of food, it's going to take a lot more food to get up to even 1500 calories. So that's one way of maintaining your weight. Um, because that's a question that I get a lot. I've just come out of the fast and I did great on my fast and I lost this weight. And now I'm like right back to where I started or um, people just don't want to see that weight come back on. The magic is not during the fasting week. It's not during the five days. That's part of the magic. But for weight loss, it's that magic comes after. And if we're eating food that is low in calorie density, all fruit, all vegetables, including potatoes and sweet potatoes, like punch it into chronometer, see the amount of fat that's in there. There's nothing in there. The reason why that's fattening is because we typically eat it with a bunch of sour cream or oil or whatnot. Um, rice, whole grains, right? Like barley, farro, quinoa, all those things. And then beans and lentils. I like lentils because they're easy for everybody to eat. Even people with like bean problems, start with the lentils. And then things that you want to limit are things like bread, <laughs> normal pasta, like the traditional pasta, but we could have brown rice pasta and it's delicious. Um, obviously like meats, cheeses, nuts and seeds, higher on the calorie density scale. However, nuts and seeds are really healthy. So we have to think of dosage. So I'm still going to eat nuts and seeds. I just don't sit in front of the TV and snack on nuts and seeds for like three hours because that's going to be way too many calories. And oil is the most fattening food product that exists. So Lots of processed products come with oil. When we go out to eat, I mean, the chefs can't help it. They got to use the oil. Maybe it's some butter. Even if you say in a restaurant, no butter, they're going to douse the food with oil because oil and salt is what makes it delicious. <laughs> they want you coming back. So it's really hard to keep that weight off if you are going out and eating a lot. Doesn't mean you can't go out. I go out a ton. I probably go out. I don't know, 40% of the time I eat, maybe maybe 30% of the time I eat out. And it's just, it's impossible to stay low in calorie density, but there are ways to make better choices. Just eat a bunch of whole plants, 
Sometimes I find myself in a restaurant and it's very meat heavy. And so unfortunately in those times you have to go to the sides. <laughs> so sure, I'll have a side of broccoli or a side of whatever, and then a side salad and some sort of starch. You need the starch. So maybe it's a potato or some rice. So, I mean, one time I ordered a bunch of little vegetable sides and two or three bowls of rice because they were so small. So it definitely looked like a weird meal. I look like a weirdo, but whatever, you know? And then sometimes I will go out and I'll have like just a normal menu item. Maybe it's like a noodle dish. So I'm eating a processed product. It's a noodle, not the end of the world. I love noodles. It's got some sort of like fatty broth. Maybe it's made with some animal broth, but I just say hold the animal, like don't put the meat chunks in there. But then there's a ton of veg in there. And that's my high calorie dense meal. So if I had a weight loss issue or a weight loss goal in mind, I'm going to be mindful of that. So I had that higher calorie dense meal. So what am I going to eat for the rest of the day? You kind of normalize when you eat a bunch of whole plants. And so you're not as full because you have so many calories in your system. So maybe for dinner, I'm going to have like this soup. Maybe I'll just have like a some fruit, I don't know, maybe some raw veg with like a dip. So it can just look like something like that. Some days you're going to want more calories because maybe you're more active. Not every day is going to, every day is not going to look the same necessarily, unless you live the same kind of day every single day, including your physical activity. So that is that. Um, so come out of there fast. Longo and his team have spent $30 million of research testing what the ideal time frame is of us being in a fasting state. And they say three days. So it's five days because in the first two days, we're getting into the fasting state. For three days, we're definitely in a fasting state. That is the optimal time for the majority of us. Now, of course, now they're developing kits for Alzheimer's, for diabetes, for cancer, so those are going to be very specific to those types of chronic illnesses. But for the rest of us, just five days and start coming out of it and then just refeed like a champ and you will do great. It will be great. Okay. Now, let's kill this. And let us, next week, I'm going to answer a lot more questions about the FMT such as people want to know, like, can I do onions? Can I do raw food? Can I cook the food? Lots of questions about soy. That is something to be unpacked. Uh, lemon juice versus vinegar. Maybe I can't do any kind of like an acid because I can't eat that. My body goes crazy. Um, I can't handle any kind of legumes. Joel Furman in his book, Eat to Live, I think that's what it's called. He says that if you replace eggs with a bit of beans and nuts, you're increasing your longevity by like 19% or something crazy like that. 19% is a, that's a big number. Uh, somebody wrote, it's all about saturated fat. So if you eat lean meat as you refeed, that's the best or like something like salmon. But I agree, saturated fat is something that we want to keep low. However, there are other food types that are much lower in saturated fat than lean meat or salmon. So if you really want to be good about your saturated fat intake, and let's say you eat cheese high in saturated fat, then eat the cheese, but like don't eat the meat, then eat like beans or lentils or have the soup. <laughs> uh, things, lots of questions about sugar, sugar and coffee. Maybe I accidentally ate sugar and I was in the fasting state. Does that kick me out of the fasting state? Uh, when's the next group reset? Listen, so enough people have contacted me and asked, like, did I miss the group reset? Yes, you did. I only do the FMD every spring and fall, just twice a year. Some people will fast too often, and I don't think that that is good. So even in a state of deep autophagy, which some fasters go crazy about, it doesn't mean that just because autophagy is good for us that more of it is going to be better. Sometimes it's actually really detrimental. So we don't want to get into the fasting state too often. It's easy for me to just say, listen to your body, but some people don't know how to listen to their bodies. So listen to what Longo says. When you're first starting this out, you might want to try it for three months in a row. So you're doing his FMD 
three months, once a month for three months. And then after that, you're just going to do it twice a year until you're 65 or 70 years old. And that's that. So I like to listen to my body. I have done the FMD more often than that <laughs> when I first started. And I don't think that it was great, uh, but it was okay. And, and I know how to listen to my body. So during one fast, I just felt a little bit weird and shaky. And I just felt like things were not right. I am a person who I, I think I am very in tune with my body. I do a body scan every day. I'm practicing that stuff all the time. So I took myself out of the fast a little bit early. So it was like on, instead of completing my entire fifth day, mid fifth day, I started to come out of it. The best way to come out of the fast. Ooh, this is a good question. And I love people who ask this. This is the smartest question that I get. The best way to come out of the fast is to start replenishing our glucose stores. When we're in a fasting state, we're burning ketones for energy. Every other time we're burning glucose for energy. During the fasting state, we're not eating a lot of carbs, right? So we're not using a lot of glucose. Technically, there might be a little bit of glucose that the body is using. It's not just 100% all the time ketone bodies. But for the most part, we're coming out of the fast. We need to replenish those glucose stores, which means we need to eat the glucose, which means where does glucose come from? Fruit, starchy foods. So start bringing in the starch. Longo recommends don't eat meat. Don't definitely don't eat cheese in the first 24 hours coming out of your fast. Now he's saying to optimize on the fast, refeed well for 30 days, 30 days. So that's what we have done in our little fasting group. The things that I have heard that I'm most proud of and I'm most happy about is two things. One person said, I used to need a lot of meat and cheese on my salads, and now I look forward to the fresh salad, and I don't need all of that stuff, all that extra, that extra. That stuff is inflammatory, and so if we eat it all the time and you're complaining about chronic aches and pains, then just try removing that for just like a week and <laughs> see what happens. You will feel a change. Uh, but several people have said, what I've learned is that I need to eat way more veggies. One person said, I need to pack in a ton of veggies into my day to day. And that is one of my key learnings when I did this. And when we do that, I love that thought because it's not about like limiting or like, I have to stop eating all this stuff. Let's say you don't have any chronic inflammation. It's not about stopping all of your favorite foods. It's about building in and adding in a ton of veggies and you will feel better. Answering the question, when are you gonna have your next group fast? I am considering, um, yeah, I love that too, Al. Just eat more veg, eat more veg, adding in the veggies. I have found, for me personally, maybe this is my age, age range, like late 40s in the perimenopausal peri state and trapping all the calories that we eat and not being able to drop it as quickly as we once did. For me, that was like under 25. As soon as I hit 25, it's like, have I been in perimenopause this whole time? I can add weight very easily now. Um, but in terms of the group fast, I am considering hosting a group fast in the last week of every month, starting next month. This <laughs> is starting in May. So let me know in the comments if that's something that you would like. I will need to have a certain number of people in each group. I want to keep the groups very intimate because I find that if you have too many people in the group, then the hour goes by real fast and not everybody gets to kind of contribute and, and ask your question or say their piece. But many people have said that the support within the group is wonderful even though I am definitely a novice in fasting, I've done the FMD multiple times. I've done it now 13 times in the last two, three years, but I'm still a novice in it compared to people who've, you know, obviously studied this and, and help people do this for years and years and years. What I found though, interesting is that I've learned enough to answer your questions. So <laughs> not once have I been stumped with a question. So I'm really just reiterating what I've learned from Longo, what I've learned from even Joel Furman, who I'm learning from right now in terms of fasting, because that's one of the modalities he takes some of his patients through. Um, also, Alan Goldhammer, he runs a fasting clinic in NorCal. So I've learned a lot, um, but it's not just about the fasting. It's so much about just 
human nutrition, about eating whole plants and things like, well, I thought that, you know, lectins are terrible for us and the phytates and some of this food is going to like basically kill us. It's like a plant poison. Interestingly, when our body has something like a heme iron and we have the chemical reaction in our bodies, heme iron only comes from animals. We could have a negative reaction inside our bodies versus we've got some cooked lectins, right? Like the gundries of the world who are like, don't eat lectins or poison. They're poisonous if they're uncooked. So who eats raw beans? Like nobody does that. So sometimes we've got to dig a little deeper <laughs> and see through this semi-crooked behavior, maybe very crooked behavior, but it's just, it's crazy. So I think that, um, so then Joel Furman, he said that when we are eating the cooked lectins and that chemical reaction happens within our bodies, all these amazing protective things start turning on. So everything that I've learned, I mean, we can get so specific, but basically everything that I've learned in the last 10, 11, 12 years always points back to eat a bunch of whole plants. <laughs> Just eat a bunch of whole plants and we will do very well. All right, so here is our soup du jour. It looks good. And we're going to immersion blend this baby just a little bit. So look at that. This is nice and softened. I can pierce through it really easily. It's a gorgeous color, but once I immersion blend it, it might turn a little green. So <laughs> let's hope that doesn't happen. But I'm telling you, my last green squash and lentil soup was absolutely delightful. Okie doke. All right, so just like a traditional lentil soup. You're not gonna wanna blitz this thing too, too much. I can't seem to get this plugged in. Hello, okay, we got it. You don't wanna blitz it too much. So if you don't have one of these and you're gonna use a blender, then just blend carefully. But you want to make sure the whole head of this is immersed, otherwise you're gonna splatter and hurt yourself. <laughs> I like a semi-chunky chunky lentil soup. I like the texture. I like how it looks. Because if it's too smooth, to me that just kind of looks like a broth. But I don't want it to be like a chunky stew. So the color is changing a little. this thing immediately you don't want to be messing around with that blade in there and getting chunks of food out because that blade is sharp okie dokie i need to get like a proper ladle but, oh boy, here we go. Ooh, nice chunk of kabocha. I haven't even taste tested this, but I've made this so many times now that I just know it's gonna be delish. And sometimes I don't need things to be salty, too, too, too salty, even though I'm a salt fiend. All right, let me get this out of the way. Ta-da! All right, now let's bring our soup over here. Get some fresh herbs in here. 
You can hand tear it. Allison Roman just does like the big chunks. She just makes it look so good. I love the celery stems. They're wonderful. A little extra spice because I do like it spicy. Some fresh cracked pepper. Oh yeah, mama. That looks so good. Alrighty. So that is it. Oh, good morning, Adrian's Arden Gardens. We just made our squash and lentil soup, Allison Roman's recipe, and we made it with a kabocha squash. So kabocha is a little sweeter than butternut. Oh yeah, that's good. That's the good stuff. You definitely taste the lentils, even though I don't even think I added a cup and a half or two cups. This squash is so nice. It could definitely use a little more salt. If I had a piece of chunky bread, that would be perfect. And in terms of the fresh herbs, you can use anything, parsley, dill, love dill in this, it's so nice. Or the cilantro, also so good. Um, you can even squeeze in a bit of fresh lime. That's something that I did not do here actually. So we can do that because that kind of flavor profile, so you've got the sweetness from the kabocha, I've got the spice from the chili flakes, I've got the salt from the bouillon cubes and it could use a little bit more. And we've got the, we don't really have the fat, but Alison Roman would glug olive oil over this. So you could do that if you really want to impress. Um, and then you need the sour. So those five flavor profiles just makes this completely delicious. And Adrian says, you were working in the garden. Well, of course you were. You're Adrian's art and gardens. <laughs> so I've got some lime. Don't ever apologize, Adrian. It's always good to see you here. So let's do that. Oh my gosh. This actually looks like an Allison Roman kind of plating style. Very impressed with myself. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's really, really nice. Yum. So anyway, very hearty. Does this have starch in it? Because that's the key to staying full when we're eating a bunch of plants. And it does. So in this case, our starch is the squash. And that's how we refeed like champs. All right. So in terms of group fasts, if there is a need for a monthly one, I am considering that right now. Um, and I meant to say that I'm not going to be fasting with you because I don't want to fast every single month. <laughs> Again, fasting too much is a thing. And I don't think that that's healthy. But um, I will do some kind of food challenge alongside you, but really just to be the person to bring the group together, open up the circle, as they say and just be there to answer your questions and be a cheerleader for you and um, send you a daily email. So every morning of the fast, I like to send a daily email and it gives a little bit of information in terms of what's happening on that particular day. And uh, the feedback is people are very appreciative of, I guess, how much detail <laughs> I go into in terms of explaining exactly what's happening to them at that time. And I also like to offer a little bit of inspiration or like an educational article to read or a video to watch because I find that when we're learning alongside the doing, it's just, the integration is just so much better. So that is that, all right? Okay, so on that note, I'm going to enjoy this and wish you an excellent Earth Day. And yeah, when we take care of our bodies like this, our bodies take care of us. Mm -hmm. See you next time.